Welcome. This is a video tutorial on how to set up OpenOTP for use with Active Directory. In addition to that, we will demonstrate the AD integration piece. We're also going to show how to enough to integrate OpenOTP for Windows login. There are two ways to set up an OpenOTP, quick and advanced. There's versions available for both. We're showing here installation of the latter, the advanced. We start off by booting our OpenOTP VM, which in more technical terms is called the WebADM, the RC Dev's Identity and Access Management Platform, on which the OpenOTP multi-factor authentication services run upon. On first boot, Configuration Wizard starts up, prompting us to configure the host network. We'll give the host a fully qualified domain name, then our company name. This information will be placed within the generated OpenOTP CA certificate, something that you can, by the way, replace with another CA later on if that becomes needed. We'll let OpenOTP to start and boot, enable lock rotate, and that basically completes the installation. Technically, OpenOTP is now fully set up, however, with an internal directory. Uh, something convenient, for example, if you wanted to onboard external user accounts to it, but as this tutorial goal is to connect with an active directory, you still need to replace and edit a few OpenOTP system files. To make those needed changes, we connect to the server over SSH. Once inside, uh, we see that there's a folder named Active Directory and Schema Not Extended. Right, Schema Not Extended, that sounds good and easy, us not needing to touch the schema. So we'll take that path. In this folder, there are two files pre-configured for AD, and we'll use those to replace the default system configuration file, storing slash opt slash webadm slash conf, the webadm configuration root. Right, let's then go to that configuration route. This is the part now where the AD integration basically takes place. In the configuration route, there's a file called servers.xml. This file lists the external services that a web ADM should connect. As we can see, there is an LDAP configured already. The LDAP now just points to the mentioned internal directory. So we want to change that to our AD now. The most important setting uh, in the servers.xml is the LDAP server IP address or the host name to which we now need to add our AD server address. Uh, in fact, let's check what that is. So we'll go to our Windows server or the AD server. And finally, the IP config gives us the address. For now, that's all that we need in the servers.xml. But while that we're here now, uh, let's have a look at what else there is. So let's scroll down a bit and we can see that the LDAP is just one of the external services that a web ADN can connect to. You have the option to configure your external lock database, HSM, push notification servers, web proxies, internal load balancers, and so forth. But that's nothing that we need to do for now, so we just save and quit. The next file and the last file is webadmmasterconf.webadm.conf. WebADM.conf equally still references to our internal LDAP, so we need to edit it a bit. We'll locate a setting called Proxy User. Proxy User is a service account dedicated to WebADM for accessing our AD. So technically, this is the account that will join WebADM to our Active Directory. Okay, well, we should use a proper dedicated service account here in this setting uh, with proper rights and all, something that's actually, by the way, in detail described in the WebADM installation manuals. But for sake of demonstration, we just use our full administration account here. So we need to know what's actually our Windows domain name, the DM part of it, to then replace that with the default mydomain.com. Well, our domain name, we can look up directly from my AD, for example, from within properties of our administrator account, like here. Now, there are multiple other places where the domain needs to be updated to. You could and you probably would update these, for example, with the simple set substitution command or then let the wizard do it. But again, for demonstration, we do it all manually here, whereas we'll be able to highlight a few relevant settings at the same time. We start with the super admins. Those being, as the name suggests, the list of admins with highest privileges. Admins allowed to, for example, create sub-admins to the system. The next one, or the next ones, are the containers. These are locations in your Active Directory to which WebADM will save all the settings. Yeah, that's correct. WebADM will store your MFA settings directly within your Active Directory objects. Something which is actually quite convenient when you think about it, whereas the settings will then be replicated along with the normal replication procedures of your Active Directory.
that is quite of a list of settings that we will need to update. But fortunately enough, we can keep the values almost as they are and simply update the domain part and adding the DC equals RC devs, comma DC equals local. While we're doing the changes, a few settings highlighted. Uh, the web apps container, that is the location to which WebADM will store applications that run upon its identity access management platform. So that was the last one. While we now here inside the webadm.conf, we'll just scroll down to see that there's no other place to which we should update the domain to. There's a bunch of other data that we could configure, HSM, syslog, but those go outside our agenda here, so we're good and we can just save and quit. All right, that's it then. That might have seemed a little lengthy process, but actually in principle, we just added our 80 IP address and our domain name. To apply our changes, we still need to restart the web idiom service. Done. So we're already connected with our AD with the proxy user account that we configured earlier. Now, WebADM installation is complete and we can access the WebADM web-based administration UI. For that, let's grab the IP address so that we know where to connect to. And we land on to the WebADM administration login page. Since our setup is still not fully completed, we need to log in with a full LDAP DM, distinguished name. We just had that in our webadm.com, so let's copy it from there, paste, and log in. As we are logging in for the first time, there are still minor setup related steps to finish up. We let the setup create the prompted object. To make sure all will work properly, we'll log out and log in again, this time with the normal username and not with the LWDM. Now we have a fully functioning WebADM connected with our Active Directory. Or in fact, the proper way could be the same overlaying with our Active Directory, whereas we now have all our configurations within the directory object itself. As WebADM, the UI that we're in now, is essentially an identity access management platform, not OpenOTP as such. We still need to add multi-factor authentication server capabilities to it which is done here under Applications, where we just click Register on our MFA service option, and the service becomes enabled. And if we click on Configure, we can see that there are a ton of settings on how we can adjust the behavior of the MFA service. But for now, we're good to go with the defaults. And that's it. Now our MFA service is ready to service authentication requests. But looking around a little bit to check our environment is actually all well set up. Under admins, we find local domain. Local domain is a domain policy object that WebADM will internally use. And we can see that the default such is now linked with our actual AD, with user search base pointing to our user's container in Active Directory. And now that we're here, let's add a finishing touch and a friendly name to our domain and type RC devs to the domain allies field and save. To test our system, let's go to an AD account. This is a fresh AD, so there doesn't look to be an user account in it, so we'll just try out with the administrator account. That's already open here. The account is not licensed, so we sort that out by activating it. The object will be extended with a couple of attributes specific to OpenRTP. In reality, the schema is not extended, whereas we chose the schema not extended template at the start, and attributes already existing in AD will be added instead. Anyway, our account is now set. Since OpenOTP overlays our AD, we have some added options in our AD account now. We can configure MFA directly here from within our account, if we needed to, and we can add ourselves a token. So we choose Register. And let's take the QR code based authenticator. With the free OpenOTP soft token on our phone now, we scan the code, and our token is now registered with administrator account in AD. Simple enough. Basically, at this point, for any web application, VPN, SSL, VPN, or such, our administrator account here could authenticate with the software token. But we're going to go a step further here in this tutorial and actually enable MFA on a Windows login. And for that, we need an add-on plugin to our Windows server. So let's grab that plugin. We can get it directly from here, parse it downloads. 
The plugin is an RC Dev's credential provider, an add-on to Windows login that we now point to talk to our web ADM setup. So this is the service URL we saw in our web ADM. We add in just some sample dummy welcome text, no certificates for now, and we're done. So we got AD accounts now added with MFA, ready to service any VPN or a light, now topped up by that we also have Windows Server enabled with the MFA. Let's give it a go then. Sign out. All right, our sign-in page is a bit different now. Fair enough, we'll type in the usual login credentials and OTP login fires up. So we add in OTP from our app and the login completes. We could have equally logged in with, for example, a push notification or YubiKey or any other mechanism. Anyway, in our web ADM, we can now see what actually took place. Web ADM received authentication request from our credential provider plugin, the Windows Server. Our AD password was validated and challenge response sent back to the credential provider, after which a valid OTP was received. Now, if we imagine we had a million actual user accounts in Active Directory, we wouldn't necessarily want to activate and register them the exact same way we did here. Instead, the users would, for example, receive an automated email with the URL to bring up the registration QR code, after which the login experience would go the exact same way as we showed here. And that completes our tutorial. For the needed OpenOTP installation packages, visit our free downloads at www.rcdevs.com downloads. Thank you.